So tonight, the topic that I've chosen to address with you is, I called it the battle for the mind. It's looking at that whole mental side of our lives and our awarenesses, how the mind works, how it operates. Now, there's a lot of talk today about mental illness, um, and the, the term is becoming much broader. It used to be that you were considered mentally ill if you were institutionalized because you were uh, you know, hearing voices and seeing things. Um, now they've much broadened that, but I, I also think the term mental illness, it tends to sound pejorative, which is really unfortunate, but also, um, you know, it, it's so broad-based, and, and besides the fact that most things that you might categorize as a mental illness probably have some physical element to them, and so I don't find it really useful to say, these are physical illnesses and these are mental illnesses because the body is made in such a complex way that we aren't able to always discern what the difference is in the same way that it's hard to tell when a problem is spiritual and when it is mental and when it is physical or how all three of those kind of work together. But I do want to understand by way of as you're on your outline, I have a basic understanding of what normal is. The human mind is amazing. It has broad capabilities. It's, you may feel like I'm not a very creative person, but think about some of the dreams that you've dreamed in your life. And you look at that and go, my brain made that up. I have that ability to do that. I maybe there are ways in which I've shut off some creativity and things like that, but the brain just has enormous potential, and so it's always hard to define exactly, okay, what is normal? Like, is my level of mental struggle or my level of being down or my level of being, you know, amped up and, you know, active, hyper, or whatever, where does that fit in relationship to normal? But I, I think that we need to be careful to make sure that we define normal very broadly. I, uh, it's unfortunate that today we've, we begin to define what normal is in a very narrow scope. And so we kind of think, well, if I feel this way, ooh, that's not normal. If I feel this way, maybe it is. Most of us are all over the map. Creative people, the vast majority of super creative people, you would diagnose as being mentally ill if you're going by society's definitions. Um, in fact, you know, the, the vast majority of incredibly talented creative people, you could easily put a bipolar label on them, and usually that's what society actually does. Because we want people to all be the same. We, want, we expect that. And as a result, if you feel like you're different than the same, you think there's something wrong with you, Maybe, in fact, there isn't. Maybe you just are the way that you are. Um, but I'm, I'm not denying the fact that there are problems that people have mentally that get in the way of them actually functioning, and their causes can be various. But, but I do want to suggest, first of all, that our society has done a huge disservice in defining what healthy is in a very narrow scope. And the truth is, it's... God created people with a beautiful capacity to be so different. And just because you might be more active than somebody else or have a greater imagination or be more introspective or, you know, whatever it is, society might brand you that way, but it's not a healthy thing for us to do that necessarily. But when we're talking about anxiety and depression, this two-headed monster that is... You know, there are 40 million adults in the United States who have been diagnosed with some level of anxiety disorder. And, and um, you know, depression, almost 16 million people just in the United States are thought to have, to be plagued by depression. Now, those are just the people who their depression or their anxiety is 
really seriously affecting their ability to function their ability to carry on normal relationships, to be able to hold down employment and things like that. So there are a lot of people who either, and though you can't add those two together because most people who have, who have depression also have anxiety. Anxiety is just the inability to, to calm down, to feel peace. It's just, oh, my mind is racing. And we all feel that sometimes. We're all, we all have anxiety, but there's a way in which there's a level to which it can really hold you back from life. Um, depression is the feeling of, of doom, the feeling of, uh, typically a lot of times when you're depressed, some depressed people really don't even see colors. Everything just looks bland. They go to a place of beauty and it just looks like, eh, doesn't do anything for me. They, you know, they'll be with people and they just feel like I'm, I'm retreated into myself. It's, and it's something that, you know, to be depressed is a normal thing. If you, I remember Pastor Chuck used to say, I've never been depressed a day in my life. And I'm like, and his wife, Kay, really struggled with depression. But I knew Chuck really well. I saw him depressed plenty of times. He just didn't want the label we all are going to experience some level of depression. And I hope Chuck doesn't mind me sharing that with you, but he's in heaven, so I know he doesn't care. And I'm pretty sure he's not listening. But, <laughs> but you know, every one of us will have a day when we have the blahs or a week or a month. You know, when you're recovering from, one of the times that I had the greatest struggle with depression was after I had major surgery, I had neck surgery. And man, for months, all I could do is go through the motions. It, it allowed me to really experience what depression felt like personally in a way that I never had before. It was like Groundhog's Day. I woke up and I'm like, I feel like I just got up yesterday. And so th there are situational depressions. You lose a child, you lose your job, your, your best friend hates you. There are all sorts of situations that can that can give you depression. And it's something that you have to accept that's a part of life, it's a normal. If you never were depressed, there would be something seriously flawed about you psychologically. But when depression just becomes the way that you're living day after day, week after week, month after month, now we're talking about something that becomes more clinical and something that probably um, needs some more attention. Obviously, if you leave depressed, anxious people alone, some of them will just want to take their own life. I know people who feel every day like, I don't want to live, and I'm thinking about just ending it. They think, and it's totally untrue, but they believe that somehow everyone in my life would be better off if I wasn't here. I had a friend who just a couple days ago um, told me that, can you tell me one way in which something bad would come about if I just took my life? And I said, I'll tell you one thing, you would make me feel guilty for the rest of my life because I feel like I should have said something that would have helped you and I didn't. Not to mention other people who love you and all. But So it's very prevalent. Now again, before we just brand it as being this is something for us to get rid of, we also need to understand that in the Bible, there were plenty of people who struggled with what would be diagnosed today, perhaps as clinical depression. And so I put a few on your thing, and I'm, I'm just going to run through these because we're kind of limited in terms of time, but it, you can read these on your own. Psalm 22, David, I mean, if, if you want a good description of what depression feels like, David, the, the, the psalmist, the, the, he's, David's amazing. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Interesting that Jesus quotes David's depressing song when he was on the cross. Also remember, David was writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just make this up and we look at it and go, oh, too bad about David. The Holy Spirit wanted this to be communicated. Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I 
cry in the daytime and you don't hear. And in the night season, and not silent, but you're holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted in you, delivered them. They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. But I'm a worm and no man, a reproach of men, and despised by the people. All those who see me ridicule me, shoot out their lip, they shake their head, saying, he trusted in the Lord, let him rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And he goes on, my tongue is clinging to my mouth, it's so dry. Of course, then the, the other, uh, in verse 16, statement that was said in, in John, um, that or it was, it was quoted in Matthew, actually, that they pierced my hands and my feet, you know. So, but remember, this is David writing this. This isn't, he's not going, oh, I'm thinking about Jesus in the future. Jesus actually, and to a degree, Jesus fulfilled some of this as prophecy that they didn't even know. But to a degree, David is just going, I mean, Jesus is just going, I feel like David did when he did this. Now, again, David also was the guy who danced before the Lord. He was ecstatic. When you read the Psalms, you would go, if there's anyone in the Bible that you might diagnose as bipolar, it's David. Seriously. I mean, today they would have him, they would be treating him for this. Because the high highs, the low lows, nothing new about this. Now, I will say, in looking at these biblical characters, Today's society breeds these conditions because we, are, we have more ways of, of self-medicating than they did. We also have higher expectations. And the truth is every one of us is doing way more and having more information than our bodies are really designed to function. So the level of stress in our society is different than the one there. David is just like talking about, I'm trying to stay alive. Um, when he wrote a lot of this stuff. But you can look up 1 Kings 19. It's a great, one of my favorite Old Testament passages where Elijah is depressed. And he gives this, this little speech to God and saying, man, look at your people. They don't even believe in you. Nobody does. I and I alone am left. And they're trying to kill me. Basically, Elijah's just saying, God, I want to die. I am so depressed. And we'll talk about it in a, in a moment in terms of how God addressed that with him. Jonah, in Jonah chapter 4, he had preached this great revival message that wasn't much of a message, but the entire country turned, you know, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the people all turned to God. And in Jonah chapter 4, he was so depressed that he was telling God, I want to die because I hate the fact that that you saved all these people. That's somebody who's got some emotional stuff going on for sure. And as I said, Job, Moses, Jeremiah, they all wanted to die. Um, Paul, you can read that in 2 Timothy 4, where as an old man, it was the last, I mean, old for him, it was towards the end of his life, and you could just see he's, he's begging for somebody to come and visit him in prison. He's, he's kind of angry and bitter with people that he feels like had done them in. He was complaining that the only guy he had with him is Luke, a doctor. And, you know, so he's going through all this stuff. Second Corinthians, the whole book, Paul just seems like he's so bummed that he has been attacked and put down and questioned. And he talks about all the things that he went through in ministry. But... Jesus in Isaiah 53, 3, that great prophecy concerning the, the Lord Jesus himself, the Messiah. And look at how in Isaiah 53, look at how it describes him. It says, Isaiah says, who has believed our report and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. That is, he, he didn't look like a movie star. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And 
We hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we didn't esteem him. And then it goes on to say, he bore our sins, carried our sorrows. He was there for us. But it's interesting that the description that he comes up with for Messiah, besides the fact that he wasn't this magnetic-looking guy and that he came out of humble beginnings, but that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid our faces from him. And again, there's nothing here to indicate that it's just talking about when Jesus had a bad day when he went to the cross. He was, to be a man of sorrows and to be acquainted with grief means more than just a passing, quick, sudden awareness. It's in his character. He was somebody who knew grief well. He was somebody who understood sorrow a lot. Um, I put Mark 14 down there as well because when you see him in the garden, you obviously see this coming out as, as he is just you know, struggling and praying to the Father and sweating drops of blood and all this. It's like, hey, again, we would have had him hospitalized. We probably just would have said, oh, I'm worried, man. Jesus usually held it together, but now he's falling apart. Um, and then the next thing you know, he's totally fine. He, and as we're seeing on Sunday mornings and, and this Sunday as we go into John um, chapter 19, it's like, wow, how does he do that? But we need to remember that he also knew agony. He also knew that, that just deep, longing of the soul. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So if, if we go, some of the greatest people in the Bible were depressed. And today, people are probably more depressed than they were even back then. So what hope is there? And maybe you're going, Dave, I hope you're going to tell me how to fix this. Um, I'm not. I'm going to try to offer some some hope from the scriptures, but first of all, in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, it's such a, such a powerful truth here. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or a disciplined mind, a mind that is under control. So, therefore, you can't say that God won't allow you to experience mental struggles. But his gift for us, ultimately, is for us to be able to pull that together and to function, okay? So, it's not, it's not saying that if I ever get depressed, if I ever get confused, I just claim this promise. No, this is the overall plan of God that he is the one, he doesn't want us to be non-functional. He wants us to be able to organize our minds, to have a sound mind. And a mind becomes sound through certain activities, certain disciplines that actually help us to do it. But at least right off the bat, we get the idea that this is something that he wants us to do. This is something that he wants us really in some ways to work on. And then over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse 5. Well, we'll start with verse 4. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So Paul is saying, he's basically acknowledging, we have thoughts that are all over the map. See, you don't need to reel them in and you don't need to capture them if they were just always all together and right. But he is saying there is a way for us to undergo a process by, way, by which the things that come into our minds, the stuff we think of, we are able to channel 
those in a positive direction and to submit them to God and to what he wants to do in our lives. And it's so important for us to understand that that is the case, but that is the process. He doesn't just take away every crazy thought we ever have, but he wants to work in us so that we are able to take those thoughts captive, that we can take a thought and then guide it somewhere. One thing that I think a a lot of people really don't understand is the fact that thoughts are just neutral. There aren't like good thoughts and bad thoughts, really. Thoughts are just things that your brain (coughs) comes up with. And it can be caused by a movie you saw or a memory that you have or what you ate for dinner or, you know, there are all sorts of things within us. And it's important to realize, I think, that you are not your mind. Just because you think something does not mean that that is accurately descriptive of who you are. Uh, There are a lot of people who feel totally defeated, (laughs) you know, in, in terms of their spiritual walk because they just are like, oh, I'm thinking or I'm tempted. I had this horrible thought. Hey, get used to it. We all have horrible thoughts. They come from everywhere. We should not judge ourselves for what we think. That's just temptation. That's not sin. How we act out on the things that we think of, that is something where we can damage ourselves. But we we need to accept the fact that this brain is capable of coming up with all kinds of stuff. And, And I shouldn't look at my thought life and say, I'm a horrible person because this is what I thought, or this is what I considered doing, or I ruminated on it. Your thoughts don't tell you who you are, but when you are walking in the the energy and the control of the Holy Spirit, then you can start to be the boss of your thoughts. You can begin to take your thoughts as a challenge and say, how can I capture this thought? How can I make this actually happen. Some of you probably remember me telling you before about, so when I first became a Christian, I was just plagued by thinking of horrible things that I had done before I came to Christ. And it was just eating away at me. And I felt like, man, I I must be a bad person. I'm, I'm a, you know, when I was a little kid, when my father was in mental hospitals most of my childhood, and my mom would get frustrated. She's raising five kids, and, and she would often say, you're sick in the head just like daddy, and things like that, and it just like plants this inside of you, and you're scared to death. And I remember hiding in a closet and when my mom was talking to a doctor, and, and the doctor said, you need to really watch your children because this kind of schizophrenia can um, quite often be hereditary, and I'm like, oh, great. You know, not only is, am I dealing with what I'm dealing with as a child, but I'm probably going to go crazy. I think I dodged that bullet, but you can be the judge of that. But, <laughs> but it, was, it, it was so hard for me because I'm like, my mind is just reminding me, playing back. And, and I had been a horribly cruel person because I was so afraid of people hurting me that I just backed everyone off the plate. I was mean to everyone. If I could make someone cry, it made me feel safer. And so I was having those thoughts, and, and the way I finally took those thoughts captive is I decided every time I think of one of my sins from before I was a Christian, I am going to, in my mind, I'm going to create a scenario where I picture the devil telling God, Dave did this, and I picture Jesus, and this is totally biblical, that I picture Jesus at the right hand of the Father saying, he did, but I died for that. That one's paid for. That's done. And then in my mind, I would just start praising God for the fact that what I had done was gone, was at the bottom of the sea. And so I literally went through that pattern when these thoughts would come to my mind. And 
I ended up taking them captive. See, the thing is, the, the devil does not want you to be praising God. He doesn't want you to be reminded of what Jesus did for you on the cross. So for me, and to this day, I can't even remember. I, if I thought really hard, I could probably come up with some, with some general stuff, but I don't even remember the things that were torturing me at that time. Because the devil's smart enough to know if I remind Dave of something that he did before, he's going to end up praising God for the fact that it was forgiven. And it was just kind of a simple little mental exercise that I did that was taking a thought and saying, what can I do with this? And again, there is great hope for the fact that we have the capacity to influence what our thoughts do to us. I can see my mind and the thoughts that I have as being distinct from who I am. Those are not my nature. My soul is who I am. My, my thoughts, my mind, that can, is a physical product that comes from all sorts of stimuli. It's all over the map. I can't trust it. I can't count on it. And it sure doesn't have the right to tell me who I am. I have the right to take those thoughts and say, here's what I'm going to do with those thoughts. And sometimes it could be as simple as, you know, a lot of times if you're feeling really down, um, just exercise can help. So if you just go, the next time I have those thoughts, I'm going to go ride the bike for a while. Or I'm going to go walk around the block. It's amazing how our thoughts can actually be reeled in. Not perfectly, not 100%. Some of these things are long-term. But I take great hope in the fact that Paul says, we can bring every thought into captivity. We can exert control and influence over our own thought life. But if we're guilty about our thought life, or if we're stuffing our thoughts, if we're like, I don't want to think about that. I mean, try not thinking about a pink elephant right now. It's like, don't do it, don't do it. I mean, that's, that's one of the devil's favorite tricks, is to get you not wanting to think something, and then it makes you think it that much more. Instead, embrace what you're thinking and ask yourself, how can I take this captive? How can I turn this into something that's actually productive in my life, if, if that makes sense? The point I'm making here is, hey, there is hope. There is a way to tackle some of these things. It's a lifelong process, but your thoughts can be taken captive. And that's what we really would desire to do. Now, you know, God gives us some tools, as I said here on the outline, not to eliminate, but to, to manage these things. And I don't know why I had one parenthesis mark without the other, <laughs> but that's the way it goes. So here are some of the tools, here's some scriptures that give us some practical tools, right? Because if I want to go, I want to take my thoughts captive. I want to grow and be, be more practical in terms of how I deal with the things that come into my head. Um, some of these scriptures can be really helpful. Philippians chapter 4, first of all. beginning with verse 6, talking about anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I'm glad he doesn't just say, be anxious for nothing. There's your command. But he says, don't accept anxiety as being normative for you or as being, that's just the way I am. But again, he says, he says, 
take everything to prayer, first of all, with thanksgiving. So prayers of thanksgiving, you dump it on him. So the first thing is, when I feel anxious about something, that becomes my prayer life. And again, I'm not talking about, God, please make me not anxious. Now, I'm anxiously waiting for you to do that. I look at what is it that's actually producing some anxiety in me, and I am going to give that to him, and I am going to thank him for that. And then again, as he goes down through that amazing list, you know, he says, the peace of God will be with you, um, and it passes understanding. So you will experience a peace that, you know, you may not even be able to explain it, but there's something about prayer and thanksgiving when used together that really does have a beneficial effect on us. But then again, he makes this list. Here's what you need to meditate on. The things that are true and noble, that is, higher things, more, you know, more, um, you know, respected things, whatever things are just, what's fair, what's pure, simple, unadulterated, whatever things are lovely, just beautiful, creative, whatever things are of good report, is there anything good that's happening to anyone? If it's virtuous and praiseworthy, meditate on these things. It's interesting that in treating anxiety and depression, one of the popular approaches now, and it used to be just, you know, the, you know, Eastern wacko stuff that tried to do meditation. Well, now, like, it's, now Kaiser will try to get you doing that because they understand there's something about focusing your mind, which basically meditation is just that, focusing on your mind. So they talk a lot about mindfulness nowadays. Again, some of this developed out of, you know, ancient Buddhist and Hindu thought. But, but mindfulness just simply means I am focusing on what I am focusing on. So if somebody's trying to do mindful meditation apart from, apart from God, they just notice what comes into their mind and they just keep making a record of it and, and looking towards it. Biblical meditation, which, you know, over in Psalm 1, it says that if you meditate on God's word, whatever you do will prosper. Everything will succeed when you meditate on the word of God. So what that means is get a focus on these kinds of things and on things that are, you know, here's what God is doing or here who's God, who God is. Our minds are bombarded. I'm, I'm reading a book by a neuroscientist right now about this too, and it's like, it's amazing how much stuff, how much data we are processing way more than we were ever designed, or this guy says that we, we never evolved to be able to do that, but I look at it and go, no, God really didn't make us to have all of the information that we have just in our phones alone, not to mention the media, hundreds of channels, everything streaming, all the stuff we hear, and it's like we're being bombarded with information. What, what meditation is, is saying I am going to step away from that. I'm going to put my phone on silent. I'm going to get in a place of very few distractions, and I'm going to focus on simple things that are just true that are honorable, that are right, things for which I'm thankful, or attributes of God, you know? And it's like, it's not like, I can't meditate on, you know, the shorter Westminster Catechism definition of God. God is spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. But I can meditate on God is spirit. Now, process that. Don't look up what J. Vernon McGee says about that or somebody else. No, just you focus on what God says in that simple way. As we meditate, as we slow our minds down to focus on specifically, and in this case in Philippians, things that are good, things that are positive, things that are helpful, the more that we do that, it's incredible how, as he says here, when you do that, the, you know, what you've learned and received and heard, the God of peace will be with you. It actually has an effect. So, but meditation doesn't happen accidentally. 
you can't really meditate while you're driving your car or while the TV's on in the background or while you're having a conversation or even while you're at a meal eating or even while you're snacking. Meditation is to say, I am going to specifically think about something about God that is noble. I'm just going to think about the fact that he's the king. You know, and I'm just going to focus on that. Because not only is that important, the things that are true and noble and right and just and all those things are important, but they also crowd out all the other stuff. The reason why we have anxiety is because our minds are being bombarded. When we can focus our minds, we give our minds a little break from that endless cacophony of boom, 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 boom. Now, we're stuck in a life that is sort of that way, but it makes it that much more important when we feel ourselves tensing up to be able to create a space to be in prayer and meditation. And that is something that, and again, don't like get a mantra and meditate on nothing. Although, the reason why people do that nonsense is because you're better off focusing on one nonsense phrase than you are on continuing the onslaught. However, as Christians, our meditation can focus on true things, things that matter, things that are real. It is not pretending. It is not watching a flame. It's focusing on some truth about God. And so that's one of the first tools that we have, I think, is prayer and meditation from from uh, Philippians 4. And, you know, you don't need to turn over there, but if you were here Sunday, we talked about this statement that Jesus made in John 18, 11, when he's about, he's being arrested. Peter pulls out his sword, starts freaking out, and he cuts off a guy's ear. And Jesus said to him, Peter, put your sword away. This is the cup that the Father has for me. And again, you can compare it with the Mark passage that I have listed there as well, because that's where he wrestled with all that. Not my will, but yours be done. And what I see here is Jesus with this amazing step of faith that he says, this is going to happen, and I'm resolved to it, and I accept it, and I even embrace it, this is my cup. Jesus knew his cup. That night, he was going to go be beaten, tried, and ultimately then crucified. He knew that. I don't know what my cup is this week or yours, but what your cup is, is whatever's going to happen to you that you can't control. Your cup is not whatever you do, stupid. That's, That's somebody else's cup. But Yours is to be able to go, there are things that are going to happen this week. There are things that are going to continue this week, stuff in my life that I don't necessarily like the way it is, but I think the way things are going, it's probably going to still be there when I get home. It's probably going to still be there tomorrow, maybe even next week. So what I'm suggesting to you here is, do you accept what you can't control? Will you take what's coming and say, if this is what happens, this is the Father's cup for me. To resolve yourself, because otherwise, most of the time we stress ourselves out, hoping that something doesn't happen, and a lot of times it's not going to happen, but sometimes it is, and stressing over it doesn't help either way. And so the example of Jesus is so clear that I have to say, whatever happens... You know, last night, Dodgers are into the 13th inning in a tie game. And and I was thinking about this very thing because my mind was going over some of these scriptures. And I thought, if they win or if they lose, what's going to happen is going to happen. I'm not going to sit here and pray for them to win. I'm going to feel stupid that I stayed up till, you know, midnight if they lose it in the 13th. They ended up winning, praise the Lord. but (laughs) (laughs) But it was like... If you don't get to the point where you are okay, 
you know, when you're going to do something and you're okay if it doesn't work out, you have an appointment with somebody and you're okay if they don't show up, you're wanting something to happen, but you know it might not. Are you okay with that? That is what it means for us, I think, to be able to just say, I will not be anxious about what's going to happen because I accept whatever's going to happen. Cherie here, I saw this when she went in for brain surgery. It was like, this isn't looking good. There's this big tumor that's all wrapping around in her head. And God gave her such a peace that she really, I got the feeling as we were praying with her and she went in for surgery, she didn't even seem like she cared that much whether she lived or died. It was like, she's gone, Pastor Dave, whatever God does, he does, and it'll be to his glory. And, you know, and it's like, that's, when you can do that, then you take on less stress and less anxiety. We're so superstitious that I think that, well, God, if I lose my legs, um, and don't say that. Like, you think because you're okay with losing your legs that God's going to make you lose your legs. That's so superstitious. But to be able to say whatever happens, and even to think specifically, what am I anxious about? What am I worried about? And say, if that is what you are going to do, God, I'll accept that. I'll drink that cup. I'll take it. If I'm like, man, I'm, I'm going through such a hard time and I'm just hoping that around the corner I'm going to get better, that doesn't help you get better. It actually makes it worse because you're stressed about whether or not you're going to get better. So to be able to instead embrace the future, knowing that it's in God's hands, and to be able to say, maybe this will happen. And, you know, like Job said, if he slays me, I'll still trust him. Like I mentioned Sunday, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Our God could save us from the fire, but even if he doesn't, we don't care. <laughs> We're not going to bow down. And so that kind of resolve, I think, is something that's really important for us. Um, now, uh, I have 1 Kings 19 there again. That's the story, again, of God, you know, dealing with Elijah after his horrible depression. He had had this great victory, called fire from heaven, and, the, you know, all the people are like, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And then he finds out, eh, it was a short-lived revival. Now Jezebel's threatening to kill him, and he's running off sniveling and, and like, God, I just want to die, I want to die. And for one thing, it's awesome that God just let him talk. And it, because he gave the same speech, like verbatim to God, like three different times. And, and God did a couple of things practical that I think are worth, and, and it's something that I would suggest sometime you might want to just read that passage in 1 Kings 19, because some of the things that God did, one of the things is he just listened. Another thing is, he said, he asked him a question, what's the problem? Another thing he did is, he made him some food. He goes, here, eat something. Another thing he did is, he goes, take a walk. Come on, let's go. And so God did these certain things for him. And he gave him some exercise. He gave him some food. He let him talk it out a little bit. And then ultimately, God told him, you're not alone. There's a bunch of guys who haven't bowed their knee to Baal. Not only that, I have a guy, Elisha, who is going to assist you. And I have a king who you're going to anoint, and he's somebody who, who respects and worships me. It's, it's not going to continue to be Ahab. So it's like, what I see in this whole thing is that God attended to his practical needs. He attended to his emotional needs. Get up and walk get something to eat, let me just listen to you, those social needs, um, and then this promise that there is help, and we're going to get you some help. So those are, those are all real, real practical things that when we do, uh, you know, when we do like critical incident stress management, people who are, who are traumatized and stuff, these are some of the kinds of things that are just standard practice for doing um, CISM to be able to just go, okay, Here's what you can do. Make sure that you do this, this, and this. 
and God got there first, for sure. Um, then um, it, some of the uh, other tools in Philippians 2, verses 3 through 5, He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Well, first of all, he said, fulfill my joy in verse 2. Being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. So in here, the whole lesson in Philippians chapter 2 is how important it is to have humility. Um, and, and so I think, too, when we become just consumed with ourselves, we need to be honest with ourselves that, you know, the truth is I'm making a bigger deal of me and how I feel. Quite often, not always, but quite often when we feel really discouraged or depressed or anxious, we have somehow inflated who we think we are and that it's that big of a deal that the world ought to stop in order for us to address our concerns. And so I'm just saying this, I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to be really cautious with how I say it because sometimes people who are super depressed, if you just tell them, you know, don't be such a baby, don't be so selfish, it doesn't really help. I'm talking about for ourselves to be able to just go, am I getting too focused on myself? Am I, am I actually, and again, there are people who have made ignorant statements that say that, you know, if you're depressed, just go do something for somebody else and do it again and then you'll be fine. No, it's not that simple. But at the same time, there's something to it that by getting outside of yourself, stop solving your own problems, but get busy trying to help others and esteeming them up. What I feel like is I have such low self-esteem, I need someone to lift me up. In reality, the problem sometimes is that I am making too big of a deal out of myself. Uh, I used to crack up when Pastor Chuck would talk about people with you know, low self-esteem. And he said, so often people go, oh, I hate myself, I'm so ugly. And Chuck would say, you don't hate yourself. If you hated yourself, you'd be glad you're ugly. And, you know, I, I, it's true. The fact that I'm so focused on me, I need to at least personally own that, that maybe I am making myself a little bit more the center than what I need to be. And there are a bunch of other passages as well um, that kind of deal with a lot of those, a, a lot of that idea. Um, in Romans 12, you can read like the first 16 verses, the basic theme of all of that is to be humble, to, to turn away from pride and self-centeredness. And as, as Paul says there in Romans 12, man, present yourselves as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God. Don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then he goes on to talk about how important it is to serve others and to be humble. So I think that's an important part of all of this, for sure. Um, and then one of the other passages that I love in this respect, Psalm 139, specifically, he's even though he's talking about even though he's pretty depressed there, um, but he's really talking a lot about anxiety. And this is a scripture that I turn to often. Earlier in the chapter, he's like, God, you know everything. You know my down sitting, my uprising. If I go to the bottom of the sea, you're there. And in the end of Psalm 139, verse 23, maybe you're familiar with this passage. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, test me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked or hurtful, damaging way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting, or in the everlasting way, the way that lasts forever. It's, 
the last thing sometimes I want to do when I'm feeling uptight is to get self-reflective because I'm just afraid. If I'm just thinking about myself more and more, it's going to make it worse. And then I'm going to think about all the reasons why I feel the way that I do, all the things I'm upset about. But what I love here in Psalm 139 is he says, God, I want you to look at my anxieties and I want to know, is there something I'm doing wrong? Is there something I am doing that is creating some of the damage that I'm experiencing that shows up in my anxieties? I, I get alone with the Lord often and I pray these two verses. You know, and uh, you, know, you may know the song that comes from that. You know, search me, O oh God, and know my heart, and so on. But what, what I do is I think about, okay, God, let's look at what I was uptight about today. What was it that just kind of irritated me, made my, made my stomach tighten? And I say, God, in that area, what's wrong with me that I let what somebody else did or I let something that randomly happened or I let something that I have brought on myself, why do I let that make me anxious? Because my response to a situation is where anxiety ultimately comes from. And so as much as I feel like, man, I'm limping along, I'm on the mat at the count of nine, last thing I want to do is, have I done anything wrong? And yet, there's some power in being able to say, I can actually take some responsibility in the way that I'm feeling and in this anxiety, and part of it is I have to own it. I have to, you know, with God's help, with the Holy Spirit leading me, I want to examine myself. Because I know, chances are, if I'm really stressed out or I'm really bummed or whatever, I can tell you 20 people that it's their fault or 20 unlucky things that seem to have happened and I'm trying to go, and I know God didn't do that. He isn't the author of confusion. But the thing is, I can't do, if you were a jerk to me, if you wrote me a nasty email, if you said something insulting to me or if you disappointed me or let me down, I can't do a thing about that. I can't do anything about what anybody else does to me, so it's wasted energy to wrestle with things that I can't control. The only person in this world, ultimately, that I can control is the only person that I have a responsibility to control, and that is me. I have a full-time job, not in fixing you, but in working on me. And so when I come to God and I ask the Holy Spirit, Help me to see about me. I have to get past all the bad things that everybody else have done and to come down to, you know what, I can't do anything about that. And those are pretty obvious usually anyway. But I can do something about me. So God, can you help me? Can you show me? What is it that I am damaging myself by the way I am responding to that which is going on in the world? Maybe it's just turn off the news. Maybe it's just, there are certain people you don't want to be around anymore. Maybe it's time to change jobs. Maybe it's, you know, the stuff that you, that you absorb or, you know, maybe it's a, an illness that you need to get some help for, talk to a doctor. You know, it could be all sorts of things, but it's like, whatever's hurtful in me, God, I am open to your Holy Spirit to reveal this. And even to reveal it to somebody else who who I care about and love. Um, Self-examination with, with God's help. And then finally, and I just said Psalms. The book of Psalms is primarily a composition of personal journal writing. Now, I, I have a journal. I write in it periodically. Honestly, I should write in it a lot more. It's always good for me when I do. Almost every page of my journal starts out with, Man, I, it's been a long time since I wrote anything. And, and then it's funny, like the other day I just dumped some stuff out there and I looked at the last entry or one from a couple months ago and I'm like, still the same stuff. But 
what, what journaling does, and, and I think everyone should at least give it a try, write something. Do it on a piece of paper and throw it away, type it into your phone, I don't care how you do it. But as I mentioned several times in this discussion, anxiety and depression primarily come from being overloaded, overstimulated, having way more stuff than you can process. It's amazing how just taking something out of your head and putting it down on paper or in data takes it out of your head and puts it on paper. But it's also a great way to self-examine, like Psalm 139, because I look at what I wrote and I'm like, whoa, that's, I, I, didn't, I never thought about it that way, but this is the way it comes. Now, again, the book of Psalms, you read them all the way through, the overwhelming majority of Psalms are personal journals that became so ubiquitous, became so universal that they put them to music and everybody sang them because we're all similar in different ways. And when somebody has a, it takes a bipolar guy like David, for instance, to put something down that it's like, wow, who said that, David or Bob Dylan? It's brilliant. And it says exactly what my heart is saying. But for us, to be able to journal is a useful way of self-examination. And it's also a great way of dumping. Sometimes part of this could just be make a list of everything you're stressed about. Turn it into some kind of a to-do list of these are the things I'm going to work on. But I would encourage you to write. So my summary of tools that I have there, and I printed it all out for you so you would have those if you don't take good notes. But here's a little checklist. I'm stressed, I'm depressed, I'm anxious. Am I praying? What am I meditating on? Those things that he says in Philippians 4, have I accepted the cup? Have I accepted that whatever happens, I will take it as being from God? Am I exercising, eating right, talking with people, getting help and support? Um, 1 Kings 19. Am I working on humility? Am I really trying to not make such a big deal about me and what I want? Um, Are you examining yourself with the help of the Holy Spirit? And are you writing? And so these are, this is a checklist that it, it can give you a lot of practical things from Scripture to be able to work your way through. Now, in closing, um, I always get questioned, what about medication for somebody who's anxious or somebody who's depressed? And I, I want to say, first of all, I'm not a doctor, as it says on there. So I, I can't tell you whether you should or shouldn't take medication. And you should never get advice about medication from anybody who has never been to medical school. Because somebody's taken medication and had it work, or taken medication and it didn't work, they're not doctors. So let's just say that right now. A lot of, a lot of people who are Bible teachers have done a huge amount of damage by making Christians feel like if you need to take medication, then you're just a bad Christian. There's something wrong with you. They're not doctors. Most of them never even went to school to learn how to be pastors, much less doctors. That's ignorant and foolish and irresponsible. You don't decide whether to take medication or not based on opinions of amateurs. Um, I do want to say, though, by way of caution, um, and, and this is, again, the opinion of a, of a person who is not a medical professional, but I've had lots of experience in this area, there certainly are those who over-medicate. I think there are some people who jump too fast. To, pretty much if you go to tell your doctor today, you know, I've been depressed. Here's your prescription. And, and I think that, you know, that can be problematic, and we should at least be cautious about that. We should also, uh, to me, let's try all this other stuff and see how it's going before we just jump to medication. Because, again, like I said in the beginning, we have such an artificial notion about what life is like, about what emotions are, about how people ought to be. And if we, and a lot of this, frankly, came from a school system that crams 
too many kids in a classroom and has too many expectations and is constantly branding people as wrong. And is you know, our educational system has created the need for an environment whereby you can manage 35 kids in a classroom and none of them showing their individuality. And if a kid begins to show their individuality, we brand them, we put them into special programs, or we medicate them. And I just have to say, that is something that is ignorant of the breadth of the way God designs people. Uh, again, I think it's fine to be a person who is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. I think it's okay to be someone who struggles with anxiety. You have to figure out, and you do this with the help of professionals, at what point is this hindering my ability to function? Because it is certainly not a good thing to just survive by hanging in there and feeling like I'm sinking. Hey, if you are even contemplating suicide, you've got to get help. You have to do that. That's a no-brainer. You kill yourself. It's over. Yeah, you'll go to be with the Lord, but the damage that you leave into the lives of the people who are left is horrible. And, and so the, these are the kinds of things that, yeah, I don't want to overdo it, but I realize society's expectations don't tell me what I need for treatment, and they don't tell you either. So if, you're, if you can be okay with who you are or just, hey, this is a time I'm going through and it's, it's not holding you back from functioning, then in my personal opinion, you, you may possibly be premature in just allowing yourself to be medicated maybe. But not a doctor, don't know. Um, I also think that you should really be open to medication if it's something that might help you. It's really foolish that if... Being on some medication for a while would really help you to function well and be more yourself and more able to express and deal with the stresses of life and things like that. Come on, we think it's okay to have comfort food, like to eat something that makes me feel better. In fact, everything that we eat contributes to how we feel. Medication isn't a lot different than that. In fact, most medications that are prescribed for mental health struggles all they do is stimulate what your body already does. Your body is designed with this, with this amazing capacity to produce endomorphic drugs. That is, your body actually produces drugs inside of you. So sometimes when that's not working, a drug that stimulates your body to produce that medication that God designed within you, but we're in a fallen world, um, that isn't something that we should be you know, all afraid of. If, if, you, if you're at the point where you feel God leading you to try it, just try it. You don't have to stay on it forever. You just see how it goes. I, I think we should be open to uh, the best medical technology that God gives us. If somebody says, well, you know, God didn't put David on medication. Yeah, I, I don't know if he would have if that had been developed. I have no idea. It might have really messed up his ability to write. I don't know. But at the same time, it's something that we should just be open to and say, okay, God, this is really affecting my ability to function. I will try whatever you put on my heart. If you just feel as you pray that I don't think God wants me to do this, don't do it. But make sure that you're not rejecting the idea of medication because of the ignorant things that other people have said, or even because of something ignorant that I might say. Uh, it's, nobody has a right to do that. Clear your mind and just go, I am open to whatever you have, and then ask God, is this something that might help? Because if you go to a doctor, they will prescribe medication pretty much. I've never heard of any doctor that said, well, you don't need medication. <laughs> I think you'll be able to suck it up a little bit and start lose a few pounds, and I think you'll be fine because medication is what they do. But I'm not going to throw it away just because of that. Uh, I per and I'm not going to tell you what to do at all. I would tell you, and I, and I am not someone who has experience taking you know, psych meds, so I don't think I'm defending myself because I'm you know, depending on all these medications. I've never done it, but I am telling you, 
I would do it in a second if I felt like God was telling me to do it, and I would not be embarrassed about it. I would tell you if I did it. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You do what you need to do to get through and be as healthy and, and as much yourself as possible. And so most medications don't make you, turn you into a zombie. They don't, you know, it's not like, well, you're, I'm addicted, and now I'm going to be a junkie in the street. <laughs> Just be open and pray. But at the same time, to me, with all these scriptures, I would start with these tools, prayer, meditation, acceptance, exercise, and eating right, and talking about it, and trying to be humble, and asking for God's help, self-examination, writing stuff down. Those are simple things to do. You could start doing those and do each of them before this week is over. So that's a place to start. But again, I'm not a doctor. I'm not, not only can I not fix everything that you struggle with mentally, I'm not even sure I would want to because I have this bias that some of the things that society brands as, a, as an illness might actually be a trait, a character trait that could be a really good thing. Um, but there you go, and that's my take on it. Let's pray. Lord, we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we acknowledge that. We thank you that we are incredibly complex, but that you know every little intricate detail about who we are, and your Holy Spirit can help us, can lead us, can help us to be functioning at our level of effectiveness that you've called us to. So help us to obey your word, to trust you with our mental health, to never just decide I'm just miserable and I guess that's the way it is. Help us to apply your word, to be open to any help that you might give us. Help each of us to learn how to live life to its fullest. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks guys.